Hey there, I'm David D'Angelo, developer of Yacht Club Games. I'm here to run you through all of our inspirations for Shovel Knight and how we came about designing them. For Shovel Knight, we were really interested in making an NES style game that, and modernizing it in a way that would be interesting to everyone. The mechanics that we were really inspired by were sort of these old abandoned or forgotten ideas. I think as a company, we like to try to take these ideas and sort of show people, hey, this is why this is cool and it shouldn't have for been forgotten. Or this is something that everyone said was bad, but this is why it's good. Or if you mix and match these in some kind of fun, new, interesting way, this is why it could be engaging. So one of the main inspirations for Shovel Knight's gameplay was Zelda 2. Surprisingly, a lot of people think it comes from uh, DuckTales, but in fact it didn't. The main main mechanics we were working with here were we wanted to do a down thrust. Uh, we saw the Zelda 2 down thrust and it was, uh, we thought you get that game, you get that mechanic late in the game and it's sort of hard to see all the possible ways you could use it. We felt like you could explore a whole game with just that. And then we also liked the idea of making that like a one-two punch. So essentially you would uh, flip an enemy over and and then try to like attack their underbelly. We decided there needed to be some kind of scooping mechanic and some kind of uh, attacking from above mechanic and that's uh, why we landed with a shovel. So yeah we did this down thrust mechanic as you can see which we call the shovel drop. When Shovel Knight hits an enemy uh, he'll bounce up. So we were trying to take the platforming components uh, maybe from like a Mario game when you jump on an enemy right you might say oh down, down thrusting, that's from DuckTales. I say no, it's from Mario. And in our game, when you bounce off a guy, you typically get a big bounce. And on some guys, when we're trying to make it more of a combat-focused encounter, we're calling back to that Zelda 2, we're giving you a small bounce. Here we got a encounter with a gold armor. This is sort of our staple enemy for if we knew our combat would be working. You can see the short bounce I'm talking about is like that big, right? In the other area, the bounces would be more for platforming mobility, so they'd be much larger. So this here is to try to keep you in engaged in the combat, right? We don't want to make you do a huge bounce, because if we do a huge bounce, it's not going to be fun. You're going to It's going to be so much time in between the interactions. We're just trying to reduce that a little bit more and make it about the down thrust and just a straight up attack. So there's two main things we're thinking about that we pulled from Zelda that we thought were exciting ideas. One, this character is flashing when he gets hit. This uh, indicates to the player uh, that they've been damaged, which is exciting, a, ni a nice fun way to do that. Uh, so when they flash, you're, you won't be hurt by them anymore. And that's important because it gives a lot of leniency in the way you can attack and like prepare yourself for any follow-ups or anything like that. I would say it's something that makes the game feel more generous than a lot of NES games might have felt with their punishing difficulty. So you can see in that encounter, right, right here, Shovel Knight gets pushed back that distance after he does a hit. Uh, and this is another way of creating an exciting, engaging encounter, hopefully. So instead of being in their face and being able to just wail on them, like you might do in, say, a Devil May Cry game, uh, which is fun for another reason, we were trying to create a more deliberate feeling combat where you know, you try to go in and get the hit and then it's a l slight reset of like, what do I do next? One big component of what we were thinking about when making Shovel Knight was how to make a compelling structure to the game. And by that I mean the metagame, what you encounter once you're outside of the stage. And one of the things that kept coming up to us as most exciting from the NES era that has, hadn't really been used that effectively was this world map. And I think uh, Mario 3 is one of the games that did the best job of sh sort of showing what that could be like in a contained space where it's not just an open field that you can wander for miles and miles. This very beginning is extremely linear, right? But when you get to somewhere like here, you get a choice of where to go. And there's a clear uh, reward or some kind of like, what is that over there? Maybe I should take this, what seems like an optional path, right? We are trying to do the same thing in Shovel Knight, trying to display a map, trying to make options for the player, different places they could go to or decisions they can make and still keep it mostly linear focus stage design in there. We wanted to have a somewhat linear path. You start in this open, this teaches you every, most of the mechanics you need to know in the main game. But from there, we have a lot of choices. Here are the two main stages you need to go to. In the map, when it first starts out, there's a little lock here. 
so you know, oh, I need to beat these two stages in order to progress. And you obviously uh, generally know you start on the left, you're trying to go to the right because there's nowhere to go on the left. <laughs> so when you get to here, we're trying to make this be this flexible, somewhat in between Mario, somewhat in between Mega Man, where it's still got this, uh, all of these are core stages I need to play. But I have these options of, oh, I went into Pride more and it's too, too easy or this is too hard. Um, or I like dip into one and then I go back to the village and I upgrade. We tried to get as many, as much flexibility in this map as possible while still, still making it this fun and engaging thing you could do. One of the fun old NES ideas we liked that was just really common in the 80s is creating a character IP. Modern games have the, the benefit of having as much text as they want, having as much dialogue and cutscenes and all that, and the NES didn't really get to benefit from that kind of thing. Um, so, but we wanted to keep it still focused on the gameplay. So you, you can see here as when I walk in, I'm gonna fight Bomb Man, and Bomb Man just appears on the screen. Oh, isn't that so sad? It doesn't say much about his character. We were thinking about how do we amplify that like m initial moment of you meeting the character to give it just, to, just so you feel like I know exactly who this is. So here we have the Plague Knight boss fight and you'll notice something very obvious right away. There's dialogue. <laughs> we didn't want to add too much script to this game. We wanted to keep it so it was still really focused on the gameplay, but we wanted to add these light story moments. So the, the second part of the boss battles that we really liked in Mega Man and the character uh, designs was that they're really simple. Uh, they take you one or two tries. They have this really natural feeling gameplay to them. So the way that we found that they did their boss fights and made them really engaging and also not too complicated for the player to do or not having to go through these all these crazy phases was they f focused on a really small set of moves and they made it really player focused. He will throw a bomb a certain distance towards Mega Man. So you can see he's got two types of bombs. He throws a short bomb and a long bomb and he's always trying to hit the player. So no matter where he's standing on the screen, it's covered. And as a player, I know exactly the kind of moves he can do. He can only do this simple bomb toss at me. And I immediately understand what I need to do to avoid it. Uh, so we wanted to try to create similar kind of tensions. Okay, so you can see just like Bomb Man, he does these big jumping arcs and they're aimed at the player. The difference here being in our game that he does a one, two, and three jump where the third is a bigger jump. So that gets combined with the very similar idea from Bomb Man that he throws a bomb at the player. So it's really simple player created randomness, essentially. The other fun component, this, the thing in this battle though, we are trying to think, how do we make this special? How do we make this unique? What do we make it that's something you haven't seen before? And this boss fight, it was all about the blocks here. So we thought, how do we take this player created randomness and multiply it by a million? And the way we did that is when he throws this, these bombs, they're gonna come and land on the ground and destroy these blocks. So now is it not only a, a, a battle about me recognizing his attacks, being able to handle them, but it becomes a, a platforming challenge of how do I integrate with what I've learned with this ever-changing terrain. Once you're used to these patterns, he's gonna introduce new things, and these are more variations on the same theme. If the player's in the right spot, he'll throw a bomb that hits that, which makes a much bigger boom, a much different reaction from these blocks. So the, it's different, different ways of toying with that same idea uh, in engaging ways while keeping the mechanics really simple, right? In the end, he still has not that many moves compared to a Mega Man boss. He's only jumping and throwing bombs and he's spawning those blocks and that's all we have to worry about. Okay, so a fun bit in Shovel Knight that everyone loves or hates are these money bags. When Shovel Knight here unfortunately falls into this pit or runs out of life, he'll drop a percentage of his gold. When we were playing these old NES games, one of the things we found was there wasn't a lot of encouragement to keep going. When we played MMOs or games like Dark Souls, 
that use these corpse runs mechanics where you're essentially going back trying to recover your stuff. They provided a really huge incentive and story to what to replaying the game content. When Shovel Knight falls in a pit, we tried things like, oh, he's going to drop the bags here or whatever. Uh, or, uh, but we ended up with these flying, these flying money bags and we thought not only did they provide you motivation or this story like, hey, I got my money bags back and I feel really happy or I didn't get my money bags and I feel like crap. They added new platforming challenges, right? Now, as Shovel Knight is going through, he has to contend with the fact that there's these, no these moving objects that he really desires. So it creates this fun second loop of playing the game because at first all he had to worry about was jumping on this platform, right? And now the second time that it's being played, it's this new consideration of I have to do it like this because I really want to get my gold back. And when I get to this pit over here, I, I have to really think, how do I even get that? This has now become a puzzle. One of the uh, iconic elements, I think, of Shovel Knight is him laying at the campfire. And you might wonder where that came from. Well, it was also inspired by old ideas. One of the things we were trying to think about was, one, how do we convey story without putting a book in front of your face? How do we do it in an interesting and engaging way that involves gameplay? And two, how do we create these moments of respite? So we were looking at these games uh, like Golden Axe, where he sits at a campfire and it's a fun, uh, relaxing thing to it. Golden Axe did this fun thing where it made this respite moment f uh, feel a little bit like it has some gameplay to it. It's almost like a mini game in between stages. So this guy is going to come up here and try to screw up your stuff. And it's not quite like the main gameplay. It's not as uh, worrisome and all that, but it gives you something different that you can either look forward to or makes the the onslaught of stage after stage after stage not feel so daunting. So here's the Shovel Knight equivalent. It's telling a little story. He's he's resting in between these big scenes, right? We got our classic campfire here. We've got a little bit of a reward, uh, like, oh, something to look forward to, right? What we tried to do with these campfires was make them not all be stressful, make some of them be stressful. So you might have noticed if you played the game, only every third one has a sequence that goes into this mini game section. Like when you go to sleep and you have dreams, sometimes it's not always consistent, right? So Shield Knight will only fall some of the times that you're sitting down at that campfire. And we wanted to give that same kind of story where he's struggling with this event that happened in his life uh, and he's having nightmares about it. So at some points in the game, you just have to catch her, right? But at other points in the game, you have to contend with almost like a nightmare, these enemies that you've seen throughout the stages you just played. So this first campfire has these enemies I witnessed in the previous stages that I had to fight to get here. It provides a sort of like, satisfaction that I've mastered these kind of enemies, right? I've, ar I've already seen a bunch of these. These enemies actually spawn a bunch more gold than normal, so it feels more like a bonus time fun thing, hopefully, rather than if I die I'm screwed in, like in a main stage. With, with Shovel Knight, we try to bring back these old ideas and we try to show that everything here has worth. Everything, we can, we can find a way to make things work and combine together in special ways. And we hope that when you play Shovel Knight, you, you go back to those games and you give them a shot and you can see the value in them. You can go back to a game like Zelda 2 and you can say, well, there's, there's fun ways to play this game. There's ways to enjoy it. Maybe if I just have a guide by my side, it will solve the problem of, of wandering into that first cave and I'm totally in the dark. There's like real inherent value, I think, in a lot of the ideas that all these developers have put forth through all these years. You know, we, we going forward as a company, as Yacht Club, I think we, we are going to try to keep pushing those, you know, making people understand that those are like valuable things. And we hope, we hope at the end of the day, you like dig through your, your dad's NES collection and you find that cool game that like, you know, is fun for you.